Welcome to the latest episode of Dialogues. If I was doing seasons, then I'd, I'd probably call this season two after a, a break over the uh, January period. So I, I might just do that. It's welcome to season two of, of Dialogues. My guest today is Reid Hoffman, uh, who will be known to many of you. He's an entrepreneur, venture capitalist, is an author, and he also has a master's degree from Oxford University in philosophy, which might explain the philosophical turn that that we take in a lot of this this conversation and the dialogue that that follows. He is the co-founder of LinkedIn uh, and PayPal. He has his own podcast, The Masters of Scale, uh, and th- with his venture capital hat on, he's a partner at Greylock uh, Partners. He's on the board of Airbnb, Microsoft, uh, etc. And his latest book is Blitz Scaling. Uh, at one point in our conversation, Reed describes himself as a predictive philosophical anthropologist. And I think by the end of it, you'll see why. We discuss, to start with, the value of philosophical thinking, uh, the importance of what he calls an embedded theory of human nature, including for businesses, the roles and responsibilities of big tech companies, social media companies, media companies generally, why it is that the truth is slow, but the falsehood is fast, and what we might do about that. We spend quite a bit of time on his uh, ideas about friendship, which are central, I think, to his moral philosophy and his his ethics and why friendship is so important uh, as he sees it as a, a way in which we all grow into better versions of ourselves. We talk about our current political divides, the importance of truthfulness, uh, and why he remains uh, not a techno-utopian. He's never been that, but uh, as he describes himself as a techno-optimist and also why he has a Swiss army knife in the glove compartment of his car. I think we'll enjoy this one. So, Reid Hoffman, thanks for coming on Dialogues. My pleasure. I'm really looking forward to this. I've been sort of digging into the, the mind the mind, the mind of, of Reid Hoffman and, uh, and your world. We, we know each other a little bit, but I feel like I know your mind even better now, actually, um, from having read about it. Uh, and I want to talk mostly about relationships, um, uh, relationships in business, friendships, relationships in politics uh, and in kind of civic life as the sort of thread, I think, running through your thought. But I just want to kind of situate you. Most people know who you are in terms of your your business profile and so on. But one of the things I discovered is that you keep a Swiss army knife in the glove compartment of your car. And I'd just like you to explain, explain why that is and what it tells us about your view of human nature and the good. Uh, in in one minute a stunning opener question i've never gotten that one before and um i'm not even sure where you discovered it it's true but like it's funny it's uh it, it, i can't it, remember it says something about your own uh depth of research that that that's such a thing um well it probably started with uh when i was a college student uh i drove around a volkswagen um beetle uh mm. convertible uh, and my uh, grandfather, who had gifted me with such 1972 uh, Volkswagen Beetle, as kind of a kind of as a, you know, hey, you're you're in college now, you need a car. Here's here's the one we're about to sell, but we'll give it to you instead. Um, he said, look, I'm only going to give this to you if you learn the capability of fixing this and upgrading it yourself. Um, and because I want, I want, I, I, it's kind of almost like a very American, you know, uh, Emerson, you know, mm-hmm. a Rousseau self-reliance, you know, kind of thing. And so I learned how the VW combustion engine worked and uh, the, 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 the um, uh, you know, kind of the spark plugs and, and, you know, all the rest of the stuff. And I was in Tahoe and the car wouldn't start. And I happened to have a Swiss army knife in my pocket and because of of my grandfather's insistence that I learned the engine, I literally pulled out a Swiss Army knife, uh, switch, uh, uh, fixed the 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 gap the gap in the points um, because that was the thing. I was like, I if if this is the easiest thing, if this is broken, then I can get this going. I don't have to call anybody. Got it going, <laughs> and then went. You know, uh, when you think about this kind of. Uh, capability of the first past is self-reliance. I mean, I, I do think we live in a great interdependence, which is good, but like, you know, also being able to to, to fix things yourself. Um, a Swiss Army knife is literally the a little tool for everything in a compact, mm. easy to carry around thing. And since then, uh, every 
car that I have, when I have a house, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, I always have a Swiss Army knife uh, because it's the, oh, could I fix that with one of those tools or could I try it and let me try it? And that's the hmm. that's the origin of that. It's amazing. I mean, also, <laughs> I, I love them as well. And I think there's even a tool to get stuff out of your horse's you know, if something gets stuck in your horse's hoof, uh, which is my, you know, my absolute favorite, you, you never know, you never know. Yes. When, when, when you can, but it's it, but it also speaks a bit, I think, to this side of you, which is a, an appreciation for the physicality of the world as well, a sort of embedded quite a, you know, there's a, a sense of it, although you're obviously, but you're intellectual and you work in tech. And so, it would be easy to sort of see you almost as I, I think a lot of people see some of the Silicon Valley people as a little bit like brains floating on a you know on a stick basically, right? Um, and that is the traditional. <laughs> yeah, sorry, you're, you're quite right. I got I, I got I got my insulting metaphor slightly wrong, but it's that's the idea. But for you, it's quite right. And this is your schooling was true of this too. It's like there's just a there is an appreciation for the different aspects of life, including the physical. And there's something of like the story of you in this in fixing with a. Swiss Army knife that speaks to that. Is that still an important part of your life? Do you still sort of uh, see yourself as a physical inhabitant of the world, as not just as an intellect? Well, very much. And I think it's almost um, the people that think it's all physical and there's nothing spiritual or intellectual is important, that's a desperate mistake. And the people that think it's only, you know, like Plato, the shadows upon the cave's wall... It's only this numinal exposition. That's also a mistake. Um, this is one of those things where it's 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 the two together. It's a little bit like why between Aristotle and Plato, I'm more Aristotle. But mm -hmm. but there's a reason why Aristotle was Plato's student, right? Like the 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 question of how you bring kind of um, our conceptual and our spiritual and our meaningful understanding of the world together into the world we inhabit, the world we 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 live in. Uh, and that's actually part of the reason why, you know, in, in, in the business world, you know, I was one of the uh, driving forces behind what was called Web 2.0, because what I think the the the, the arc from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0 was, Web 1.0 is you go to the cyberspace, you go out into this new kind of luminal thing, what you see from Ready Player One and other kinds of things, and maybe even returning a little bit with the contemporary discussion around the metaverse. And I'm not Reed, I'm, you know, Anime Fan One or something like that. Mm. And the Web 2, uh, I think, transformation was bring in real identity, real relationships, and have it interconnected, have it be the what I'm doing here on the internet is all about a set of things that matter to me about my relationships in the real world, the, the, the people that I work with, the people I go through life with, the people I uh, build projects with and do other kinds of things. And, uh, and then to, to bring those together and make that transformation of the physical space through the blend of the electronic space and the physical space together. And, and that was also, you know, a similar part of the kind of the philosophy and the way that I think of these things. Yes, I, well, I think this relational aspect of your of your thinking, which I, I do think is this golden thread that cuts through. And I'm just reacting to the sort of the different versions of the internet. I mean, one of the the, the 1.0 version is almost like the straw man version of liberalism that, that communitarians like to paint, which is it's sandblasted of all relationships. No one has any prior commitments. We're all, you know, whatever it is, nerd one, two, three. And, and, and it's sort of with one bound, we can be free of all these annoying and built embedded relationships. Uh, but there was a bit of truth to some of the early discussions around it, that it was almost going to be this frictionless, you know at atomistic is a word I, I typically hate using because i think it's because of caricature but but there was almost a, a feel to that right that it was going to take us out of some of that embeddedness and part of the challenge of 2.0 is how do you get that relational aspect without the physicality because i think so much of our relationship is based on some kind of physical I mean, we're doing this kind of remotely now so it's a good example but we have met and so you slightly wonder how do you get the relational depth the, using online tools or tech that we would typically and historically have gotten through physical contact. 
Well, I mean, the good news for the pandemic side of things was that it has been a long goal on a number of technologists to figure out how to make place um, and geophysical location somewhat more optional than uh, of necessity. Uh, now, many of those, you know, kind of call it uh, techno visionaries go in vectors that I don't fully agree with. Like I've, I've never been a believer that we would prefer to strap on a haptic suit, a goggles and live in the metaverse. Now, if you're, if your physical world is so bad that you want to do that, well, it's possible. It's possible to trade up, but, but we as human beings, you know, kind of think of the Yuval Harari sapiens and other kinds of things. We are, we are social animals or as Aristotle would say, political animals. And part of that is that we were even the introverts among us, even the, 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 the isolationist among us do all get some degree of connection by tribe. <coughs> and we don't, we don't, we don't, the only way you can live as Robinson Crusoe is an adjunct to society. Like the society is still there. This is actually one of the reasons why um, I was recently reflecting my very first television appearance was on, um, and maybe some of your listeners will remember this, William F. Buckley's Jr.'s firing line, because they were looking for a technologist who would defend that the government can and should regulate speech on the internet. And um, and this is one of the things I say to everybody, all comers, technologists and everyone else, is like, we do regulate speech. We regulate speech all the time. We regulate speech, truth in advertising. We regulate speech, child pornography. We regulate speech, terrorism con content or other kinds of things or incitements or planning or conspiracies to violence or criminal activity. We regulate speech all the time. Um, the uh, question is where we set the line. So it isn't this purely mm -hmm. principle of no speech shall ever be regulated. It is written in internet stone. It's actually, in fact, is the question. Now, I think there's equally wisdom to say we should be very cautious about when we regulate speech because, you know, there's a slippery slope to kind of an Orwellian, you know, kind of Pravda, you know, regulation of, you know, this, this shall be the only speech. Um, and so you want to be very careful to have as broad a, uh, a, a, a penumbra as possible, but we do actually in fact do it. And part of that's because we do live in societies. We do live in these tribes. We do live in these, you know, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are social animals. Um, and, and so therefore, you know, these, these things like freedom of speech come together with how well we organize society. They're not as I think a number of people are advocate like some kind of independent principle standing in a luminal space like Plato's cave. Mm. Uh, but it actually is, is part of how we organize society better and better. And so we should always think, just as the mistake is say individuals only, it's like, well, no, no, you should think individuals and society and you should put them together just as much as you should think physical world and, you know, kind of uh, spiritual space, idea space and put them together. And this is, I think, these fusions and doing it in very healthy ways is part of how you uh, we chart progress as humanity, uh, all the way from the scale of humanity right. down to individual human beings. But it's because of this you know, relational view of truth seeking, right? That's the epistemology that, that I think you and I would agree on um, and why I would tend to favor more social regulation of, of speech or uh, uh, developing the virtue of truthfulness, both as individuals and, and as institutions. And as I understand your, your argument for philosophy, and you've written quite a bit about why it's great to do philosophy, and you yourself did a master's degree in philosophy, and I have a PhD in philosophy, so soundly agree with you there, fantastic, um, is because of this skill, right? It's not so much a body of knowledge as much as it is a, it's a bit like the Swiss, a Swiss army knife, uh, of the mind, uh, it's it's just it's a you know, here are different tools that I and it just teaches you those tools. But you have to engage with somebody, right? Yes. You don't you don't you're not Robinson Crusoe. That does require the engagement, yeah. and that does so. It's in the engagement that you get closer to the truth. So you need people to engage with, and more specifically, you need people who you disagree with to engage with you. Yeah, and to, to make that point, and I think as a decisive knockdown, there is no credible side on the other argument. Frequently, the the individualists who argue this kind of you know, kind of um, 
libertarian, but also kind of like, no, 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 the Robinson Crusoe is the state of nature. It's like, well, remember, we were all children once upon a time. Like, we don't spring like Athena from Zeus's brow. We grow. Mm. And that socialization, like, like the, they have seen feral children, children raised by wolves. They don't have the same cognitive capabilities. They don't develop the same way. So, no, no, we, we develop and we refine. And our ability to go off and think for a month by ourselves is because we've grown in that environment of dialogue and interaction. And that's actually, in fact, essential to all of our cognitive capabilities. doesn't mean we can't go spend the month sitting on the hill in deep mm. thought and come back with something original and spectacular – but right, it comes from this 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 kind of practical engagement of talking to other people, of engaging with other minds, of engaging with other perspectives, and using and here I'll call shift to Hegel a kind of a Hegelian synthesis mm -hmm. through dialogue as a way to uh, approach truth. Well, I'm just going to mention John Stuart Mill so that we don't end the podcast without mentioning John Stuart Mill because I feel I fear that you might not mention him. Uh, so I've just that's out, we've got that out of the way now. But um, one, maybe we'll come back to him. One of the one of the things you've said is um, which I think is d directly related to this view of uh, of relational uh, truth seeking and the seeking of the good. Actually, is you said you said entrepreneurship should include an embedded theory of human nature. And by an embedded theory of human nature, I understand you to mean that you need to think about people's identities, how they assert their values, who they are in the world, rather than just as sort of narrow utility maximizing individuals. So it's like a Akalov kind of like, it's just a broader view of human nature. Um, so it, so it sounds like I'm getting that r right, but can you give some examples of how in your own firms or in firms you've invested in it, that, em that embedded theory of human nature can can be seen like how, how does it work in practice in terms of your your own business practice so one of the things that i discovered with some delight as an entrepreneur and as an investor is to some degree i'm call it a predictive philosophical anthropologist which is mm. if you're intervening in the world to create this technology um, and most of the technologies that i directly participate in anything from obviously uh, my first startup, Social Net, LinkedIn, but also PayPal as part of the founding team. Airbnb is kind of the Series A uh, investor and and kind of partner, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, is okay if we're shaping this new technological ecosystem. These are all consumer internet software ecosystems where people participate in a great network. The network might be a marketplace like Airbnb might be a transactional place like PayPal, might be a identity and workplace like LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. If you're participating in this, how do you see yourself? How do you see other people? Um, what is the environment for interaction? What is the environment for communication? What is the environment for agreements? What is the environment for transactions? And then um, uh, when you're looking at this, you're looking at Okay, if I create the following thing, and by the way, there's stages of startups. There's the early product market fit. There's the grow to scale. There's expanding it into a platform and doing other things. There's all these ways of doing it. If I'm doing that, how do I craft this such a way that the individuals who are participating are uh, better themselves, better off themselves for participating, and then the whole group, the whole network, the whole society, the whole, you know, kind of – uh, group is much better off as well and you're architecting those two things now the thing that got me thinking about how to how to articulate kind of the theories of human nature and by the way there's like it's a little bit swiss army knife there's a whole set of tools you could think uh well there's personality categorizations like myers-briggs there's needs things like maslow's hierarchies there's um you know questions around you know because human nature to some degree we always refer to it as a static, like stone entity, but I actually think it's dynamic with the mm -hmm. this, the societies and technologies and other kinds of things we're in. And she's like, okay, what what does that evolve to? Where do you start and what does it evolve to? And one of the ways that I started trying to get people uh, within the valley to think about this and take this more seriously, because I was looking for a bold rhetorical move, is I said, well, I invest in one or more of the seven deadly sins, because I was going to... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, kind of Aquinas with this. And part of the reason why 
the kind of seven deadly sins was these are deep emotional triggers within the broad swath of humanity. And the idea is you 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 could engage with them. That gives you a strong emotional reaction into it. And then can you transform them into better things? And so then, you know, some wag in the audience would usually say, what's LinkedIn? I'd say greed. You know, they'd say, you know, what's Facebook? And I'd say vanity. They'd say, what's Twitter? And I used to say vanity. I've now come to realize it's wrath. Um, you know, Zynga, it's sloth, you know, as kind of ways of doing that. And and what you do is obviously that's a very that's kind of a, a an, an arc, and then your transformational belief about where you can move to make this much better for the individuals, much better for the society, is how do you pattern those dynamics of connection and interaction and identity and the reflection of you that it shows to yourself uh, in order to 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 build in a direction. And you begin to, and by the way, this also then allows you, I mean, I think relatively few people have done this, to do kind of scale anthropology, scale sociology, scale psychology, maybe even scale philosophy, because you have this, you know, uh, hundreds of millions, billions of people interacting in the system, and you could begin to do it in your interactions of how you design the system. And so you begin to get that, you know, how is it that we are getting to a, much better set of outcomes. And then in the business world, how do you operationalize that with dashboards and OKRs and so forth? Now, obviously, on one sense, a theory of human nature is a complex thing um, that is difficult hmm. to measure in, call it 10 variables, which is a dashboard. But you get approximations for what you're looking for for your target outcomes for individuals, your target outcomes for the system in order to so do. And the, mo the most important thing for you is that there is a clearly articulated theory, which is helping to drive rather than what the specific theory is, I, I, you know, I guess, within reasonable bounds that I was thinking a bit about the seven deadly sins. And actually, the, I think the more the original framing, uh, and here we can get into some early religious history, why not, uh, is more around the, the passions. And the, there was there's a count, there's a sort of completing set of virtues and vices which actually derive from the same passions which i think is close to what you're kind of getting at too and so rather than like you know whatever the sin is like lust ergo what you need is you know you, you need to be ab abstinence right no what you're talking about there is a passion yes and the passion can be diverted in kind of positive because you want desire like desire yes is, is good yeah. <laughs> uh, and you can take it all, so through the other it feels like that's closer to what a hundred percent. And actually, well, that was the right. echo. I was using the – most people I haven't don't have the knowledge of the history of the details of the passions and so forth and then how – because the sins are essentially the corruptions of the passions and how do you actually have the elevation exactly. of the passions. So like, for example, desire is also the appreciation of beauty, the aspiration to, you know, kind of a better world or a better set of interactions. And so, you know, yes. precisely. Yes. It goes, but yeah, I just wonder if this cuts the other way too, and this will get us into maybe some of the, your, some of the way you think about the responsibility of, of companies, right? So, so we need a, we want an embedded theory of human nature, and we've talked about this so far as your the customers, the people that you're serving. But I wonder if it doesn't cut the other way too. If you think about the ethics of of a company, of the leadership, don't we also need an embedded theory? of corporations and corporate leadership. I mean, you've said publicly that, me that Facebook meta that should elevate the social fabric. And so let's just turn it on its head a bit. And I'm a consumer. I want, I want, I want an embedded theory of the corporate leadership. And I want to know what their values are. I want to know what their identity is. I want to know how they're thinking about the world. I want to know what their ethics are. I want to know which moral philosophers Mark Zuckerberg is, is reading. Doesn't it, isn't it equally important? Because so far we've done it unidirectionally. It's you know the corporate the corporate world deciding what their theory of what me what I am as their consumer, but it seems to me that I as a consumer have every right to ask the same question of them. Don't I? I broadly agree. I think actually, in fact, one of the things that the world of social media etc. brings that I hope we will we will evolve in the direction of is more direct understanding of kind of our leaders across the spectrum. Um, and I, what I mean by spectrum here is not just business, uh, but everywhere else, uh, politics, NGOs, et cetera, academics. And I would think that 
because we now have the vehicle by which people can speak in their own words, it's not always intermediated by a set of, you know, kind of media priests, however you want to articulate mm -hmm. journalists and all the rest, mm -hmm. which I think is a, there's a, there's some challenges with, but also a bunch of virtues with as well. Um, I think it, it's, it's one of the things what I'm hope, what I would hope for is we would actually in fact have more of an ability to say, this is, this is what I believe. This is what I'm building towards. This is where I'm going. I think it's imperative that we in the technology industry do that because if you say, well, what are the major changes that are happening in the next few decades and probably there thereafter as well. Uh, obviously, technology is very fundamental to that drumbeat, and a bunch of the the way the technology is being developed is through corporations um, broadly, um, and the way the technology is being brought to millions to billions of people is through corporations broadly. Mm. Um, and so, therefore, it's more imperative to say, "Hey, here, here's who we are. Here's what we believe, and here's where we're heading." Um, so that the rest of the stakeholders in this can at least have the chance of dialogue and reflection, right? So, um, right. like, for example, I think it's pretty obvious that as a society, we should be having another discussion about what the, how to interpret freedom of speech now and what does that freedom of speech mean and and how that should be reflected in terms of how we all think about this. Um, for example, Rene DeResta at Stanford, I think, has a very good phrase, freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. So the fact that, you know, mm -hmm. I can say things, you know, individually at a dinner party in a soapbox at the court, local corner and so forth is not necessarily the thing of where I can promote Pizzagate or, you know, Plandemic or other, you know, kind of absurdities, which unfortunately we don't have the antibodies for for this kind of pure craziness you know hopefully we'll get the antibodies but it's right. but it's but it's literally kind of a it's a rorschach test for are you in a unhealthy community are you uh not sufficiently prepped for these things in education and knowledge and science if you fall prey to these kinds of 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 theory beliefs um and and we need to get more robust there. Um, and by the way, that plays into what does freedom of speech mean? Um, because yeah, and I, I, I yeah, sorry, oh, go, no, no, no. go. Well, I was just thinking. I mean, I've had uh, Jonathan Haidt and actually Nick Clegg and uh, Jonathan Rausch are talking about this quite a bit. And uh, I guess I'm re I'm a bit more optimistic than some people are around this. And it's really about this skills question. Um, so I, I think two things. One is it's like the traditional debate about freedom of speech is amendments and governments and all of that, where it's, it's much more, that's not where the action is or where the interesting ethical questions are now, um, not the rooms you need to be in necessarily. But also just because I think this is, I think you've just said, said it very well, this antibodies point, which is our culture will adapt we will develop the skills i even see it in my own kids you know they're in, in their ability to to see to sort the wheat from the chaff and they know they like they know it's clickbait even if they click on it they can they, they, they just have an understanding which my generation doesn't have as much and their grandparents generation who are consuming a lot of this stuff and kind of have none of that right and so i just think part of me is just like do we just need to be a bit patient and be a bit optimistic and the skills will develop. But then I'm told, well, well, then people then say, well, democracy will be gone by then. We don't have time to wait. Uh, and, and I don't exactly know where, where I land on that. So I can be talked out of my optimism. So I am also optimistic, uh, both around the vectors of human beings improving uh, over time. Um, and I think your generational parallel is exactly right. And also about the ability to shape technology to be better. One of the things that I uh, feel like a little bit of a of a voice crying out in the desert at the moment is we have so much tech clash going on because people in government feel like they're not quite in control of it and feel they should be. People in media feel like they're not in control of it and are mistrustful of tech leaders. Um, that 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 there's kind of a broad anti tech clash, whereas actually, in fact, I think tech has to be part of the solution. 
There is no rollback to the past. There is no enshrinement of the past. The question is, how do we build towards the future? And by the way, then when you go to how do you build towards the future, you go, okay, what are the sources that we have figured out that d can can hire and deploy and build technology? And then how do we amplify them? Because you say, well, we'll have the government build us. Well, I've never seen the government outside of a wartime ever build technology effectively. So like you're talking about a new invention in the history of human race to do it that way. Well, not impossible, but like, like you don't have default history on your side. Whereas you say, mm -hmm. well, I do know a bunch of different ways companies can build technology. And so I tend to say, well, like, how do we upgrade the ways that technologies are building technology in ways that hit more of the future humanity that we want to be? And what do we do there as a function of it? And I think technology can be an essential part of the solution uh, thereby. And so I'm also optimistic that way. Now, that being said, um, uh, you know, I don't have... Um, I do think that we will, like, well, how, like if you step back from first principles, which is how you should always think about these things, and you say, what should the design of our media space be? And the fundamental thing we would want is a design of the media space. And that, I'm not just talking about internet and social media. I'm talking about all media, you know, radio and television and, mm. you know, da da da, uh, podcasting. Um, is we'd want the media space to uh, be a collective learning that we all learn better over time. That doesn't mean that everything is said is false or uh, true. Doesn't mean that there's a, pe like a, a penalty for every false thing that's said, etc. But you have a, the, the system design so you learn and you improve because one of the places where I'm also optimistic about human beings is that over time we learn and improve. We might get grabbed in a time out of fear or hatred or anger or one tribe's competing with another or bad tendencies that have been, you know, so far the length of human history, like a tendency to racism, a tendency to sexism. You know, if you go back even a hundred years, let alone a thousand years, it used to be like racism would be celebrated. It'd be like, yes, that's the way we work. And you're like, ah, oh. the norm. <laughs> right? <laughs> We're making progress out yeah. of it. It's really awesome. Um, but it's, you know, the, it, the, it's tough going and, and hard to make that happen. Um, I think that that you also need to design their institutions and our media in a way to bring out our better selves. I don't think it happens just like there's a reason we have laws. We don't put a million people together in a city and say, happy utopia, you're all educated, we're going to have no crime, <laughs> it's all going to work. You actually have to have institutions, you actually have to have patterns in which the interactions work. And that's also where I'd say technology can be part of the solution in terms of how we get there. We just need to be thinking about what is that evolution of human nature. And, and part of what I think is naive mm. about the, the, the pure advocates of just let everyone say what they're going to say, full stop with freedom of reach, is that we've seen a little bit of what that leads to. Because uh, what's I think it's the Churchill quote, you know, the the the, the a lie uh, travels around the world three times before the truth has even put its boots on. Yes. Um, and another way that I've been thinking about putting that, which is interesting because technology accelerates everything, is that truth is slow. When you look at actually all the mechanisms that we have for truth, most of which are go through a selective panel of people. So you've got, you know, juries for cr criminal, you've got, um, you know, kind of. Uh, review mm -hmm. boards for academics and science and other kinds of things. You have, you know, kind of parliaments and everything. You you take a group of people together in order to do it. That's always by nature it's slow. So we need to figure out how to, in the acceleration of our media space, bring back in some of the, call it, you know, kind of in a weightings of improve towards truth over time. Uh, and that's actually one of the problems we need to solve collectively. Fasc it's fascinating. I mean, what you see in, uh, in academia uh, is increasingly, particularly top, top scholars just going straight to working papers, uh, or sometimes kind of think tank papers, like there's just no way they're going to wait the two, two, three years to go through. And, and then it does get peer reviewed, but actually it's their reputational capital. I'm thinking about people like Raj Chetty, who works in my field on intergenerational mobility and so on too. And so there is this sort of move in academia to want to be, get, get good stuff out faster at some cost, for sure. Um, but are there ways to responsibly accelerate truth? And at the same time, are there ways to responsibly slow down 
untruth or or false to put more friction into the into the system so it seems like you're wanting to do a bit of both right how exactly. can we make it make it a bit of a fairer race yes um and be between we, between the two because in the first principles on our media system it has to be a collective learning system right it isn't one group controlling right. another it has to be collective learning yeah and one of the things that i i mean jonathan rausch's uh book i don't know if you know the constitution of knowledge really talks about the institutional side of it and one of the arguments he and i had was was I was sort of pushing hard on the individuals and the more of the, vir the virtue of truthfulness, which I've written a bit about. Um, actually, Bernard Williams writes about Nietzsche, who I know you're, uh, you're a fan of too. And, and the, the idea that the person speaking to you is speaking in good faith and saying what they believe to be true at the time that they say it, and they'll change, they'll change what they say in live evidence is more important, actually, than what, whether the, what they say is, is true. So the, the, the bottom line is that truthfulness is more important than truth and that it's also the way you get there and john was like yeah but people the question people can do that on their own and it's a bit like the debate in behavioral economics which is there's a sort of caricature view which is that people people are just never going to do the right thing right we're just there's a reason why we have paternalism people are pretty short-sighted and dumb and whatever and there's an alternative view which is people are awesome they'll always get it right and we just need to get everyone else out of the way and what you're doing i think is striking a very aristotelian sort of you know embedded view which is yeah sure people can get better and we are getting better and they can do a lot of stuff but they can't do it on their own and we need institutions that go with the grain of the good but is that a fair way to summarize your balance that's a fair way to say and another thing that's actually pretty like from the philosophical background and by the way i was i'm a fan of both bernard williams and nietzsche um uh if i had met awesome. bernard williams earlier in my time at oxford i might have stayed in philosophy because the kind of philosophy he was doing was much more um, much more appealing to me than the the classic analytic philosophy that I was doing, and yeah. um, and so uh, you know I think part of the thing about this is there's a there's a mistake that people use generally when they philosophize about human nature, which is they say like all humans are good or all humans are bad or all humans are selfish. And actually, in fact, what I think the more interesting way to do it is to say, look, along a vector, how would you plot the distribution of human beings? And then how does that distribution alter as you alter kind of circumstances around that human group, which could include, you know, um, economics, it could include technology, it could include incentives, it could include institutions as ways of doing it. So I think you'll always have, for example, you know, liars you'll always have selfish mm -hmm. sociopaths, you always have that. So you can't say, I presume everybody is going to be a seeker of truth and, 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 and in earnest about the truth. Um, and, and yet, um, you can say that some people will be, and it isn't that because mm -hmm. there are people who aren't, no one is, because I think we've also seen clear instances, not just scientific progress and a bunch of other things, but, but through our, to who we aspire to be that. And so, so everything that you just said about the pragmatism and the use of institutions and the use of, 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 of how do we set our scenario so that we're all better, but also the understanding that, um, that human beings, um, yes, you might say there's a variation that we include both elements of, 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 of kind of criminal passions mm -hmm. and aspirational passions, and that those are in different balance and different people due to reasons of both nature and nurture, another usual false dichotomy. Is that nature and nurture? And you're like, well, there's a nature right. impact, but there's a nurture impact. There's both. So, you know, grow. And so um, anyway, so that's, that's what I would say um, as part of the, the making judgments. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's very difficult about society is that um, too often – uh, technocrats think you can get precise global rules right. And actually, in fact, it's always a statistical thing. Like you, you set a law to put criminals in jail and let, you know, uh, for, you know, law abiding people to go about their free and happy lives. Um, well, when you set that law, you will put some innocent people in jail and you will not catch some criminal people. It's always a thing. Right. And you're tuning it for that. And that's, that's part of the understanding of the pragmatism and messiness of life. That's also true of social media and technology and all the rest of the stuff. And so you have to, you have to, as, as much as the rhetorical simplicity of it's all X um, really, unfortunately, rings a polemical bell within the human heart. Um, you have to be a little bit more sophisticated about this.
Yeah, yeah. I think that sort of the, not only the recognition, but celebration to some extent of the inherent messiness of human societies is, is what marks someone out as a sort of small L liberal, uh, in my view. And I'm, I also think that this, there's a kind of equilibrium question here, which is you want a society where the presumption is of goodwill, right? The presumption is that this person is being honest and truth seeking rather than the opposite. There's this famous quote from Jeremy Paxman, who is a very, a very famous TV interviewer in the UK who you may have kind of heard of. And he said, my philosophy whenever going into interview with a politician is to ask myself the question, why is this lying bastard lying to me? Uh, and, and it's a quite a good heuristic in some ways for kind of interviewing kind of politicians, but, but it's not a good heuristic for living well in society, right? Most people are not lying bastards, they're not lying. And even if, they, even if they're speaking in, inaccurately, they're not lying, yes. right? They're, not, they're, they're wrong, but they're not yeah. What do your friends look lying. like and what does your life partner look like if that's the way you're approaching the world? <laughs> Exactly. Yes, it's, it's probably not going to be great for your well-being. Actually, well, that's a good segue. I want to talk a bit about friendship uh, and and uh, the role of friendship in your your own thinking and your own your life. I'm going to quote quote something that you you said. You said, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, whether you have one true friend or many, friendships are what give our lives fabric and meaning and joy. As you learn friendship, you learn to be a better friend with yourself. The older I get, the more I believe the meaning of life is given through our relationships with other people. It's a, a beautiful summary, I think, of this centrality of friendship to you. And of course, you're an Aristotelian in, in many ways. And so Aristotle has three kinds of friendship, as you will know, the friendship of utility. It's useful for us to be friends. The friendship of this is fun, a pleasure to be fun. And then the, the perfect friendship, which is, you know, we're good and virtuous and so on, which I, I think I'm getting this right, that Aristotle said that a friendship like that is almost like one soul in two bodies. And it's a good, it's a good in and of, it, of itself, right? So it seems like you're leaning towards the third version of a kind of friendship. You have quite a noble, elevated, in some ways, almost quite a utopian view of the role of a friendship in life. Can you say a bit more about where that comes from and, and how it operates in, in your life right now? And I guess whether it's changed in, in recent years. Well, it's certainly not changed. Um, the If anything, it, it deepens and, and, and goes over time. And, and I think friendship is one of the great paths of aspiration like how do we make each other better like for example how how would you like the whole world to be with regards to how you interact with them and they interact with you wouldn't it be great if the whole world were friends right obviously it's difficult to do on a trust and everything else basis but you know wouldn't that be a great place and that's part of the i think the aspirational thing where actually in fact many ways and it goes almost like back to you know the earlier question is as adults we were all children and i think part of how we learn to be better adults is through friendship, through friendships we form as children and how we interact and 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 so forth. And I think that was for me, it was that the reflection on friendship as part of a very central part to the to being the person who I have become. And in my theory of friendship is that two people fundam my fundamental theory of friendship, which I will write about at some point, is that Two people um, kind of make a kind of a an agreement to help each other be the better versions of themselves, right? So, you know, it's the who are you and who are you who should you become and who can you become, in with a theory, human nature and those of who that is a who is the better read, the worse read, to help you become the better read, and then vice versa, the better Richard, all right, as a way of doing this, right. and that. Um, there's all kinds of things I think you start realizing once you have this, this, this kind of understanding of friendship about how to approach life. Because, for example, I believe very strongly that you really only can be friends with someone if you explicitly discuss the friendship. If you discuss like how we're friends with each other, how we're trying to be better. Um, because you know what most people do is they kind of say, "Oh no, it's kind of awkward and feels manipulative," or, "Hey, we enjoy this discussion, or we enjoy going to the ball game together, or whatever." And you're like, "Well, yeah," but if your theory is how do you make each other the better versions of yourselves, then 
you have to have, like for example it's useful for me to articulate hey richard i think this is the better version of yourself this is the this is one of the things i'm going to have in mind as i as i interact with you and nudge you a little bit you know in our in our interactions or mm. uh, this is one of the reasons i might challenge you on something when i go well i don't think you're quite being sympathetic enough to the other to this other point of view or or you might want to add this into you, to how you think about the world or how you, or your value set uh, for the following reasons and that's part of how you make yourself better and and when I think about um, you know the great gifts that my friends have given me uh, through my life it's through that real evolution I mean part of part of the like I, I like uh, take take a conversation I had with um, very one, one of my good friends from um, you know uh, the community of color you know <laughs> this is revealing a, a bit of a personal uh, idiot moment um, is I was like oh it's a safe space it's a safe space <laughs> yes. well but it was like oh um, you know hey we're just going out of the pub why do you always dress up like why do you always put on crisp nice clothing when you're, you know we could, we could be schlubs going to the pub together and he turned to me and said look Reed, you're white. You're like, you can dress up as a slub. The cab will start stop for you. The police officer won't hassle you. Mm-hmm. You know, et cetera, et cetera. Me, I got I got to put on this nice sweater and so forth because I don't know what's going to happen there. And I was like, oh god, I feel like an idiot, <laughs> right? But it was a gift. It was a gift because it was like, oh, wait, your experience, the exact same environment, is different than mine. Your experience is because you're in a minority position of of a societal bias and a piece of oppression. It does not feel like home to you. It does not feel like safety to you. So you're getting ready for those kinds of things. And I should recognize that. And I should not only be your ally individually, but I should pay attention to this more globally as a citizen. And that's a point of which, you know, Craig helped me evolve, right? He it was right. like literally like, I remember that conversation with crystal clarity. And it has informed many paths and decisions since then. And that's part of what we can do with 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 friendship uh, with each other. So you came you 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 came out of that as a better a better a better read. Yes. But the so it's sort of a utility friendship in the sense that you know utility in the broadest possible sense of the friendship is going to help you to become a better version of yourself. But it does presume that that's what most people want. And do you think that most people are seeking to become better versions of themselves? Do you think that they ought to be? So I definitely think they uh, ought to be. Um, okay, so you're, so you're willing to be quite prescriptive a about thousand it. People percent. should try to get better. Yes. Right. So you're, um, you're a perfectionist in that sense. Unambiguous. Right? We should all be or, striving. Or, or as I put in my very first book, The Startup of You, we're in permanent beta. I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a perfectionist. I'm a permanent improver. It's always yeah. seek to be better. Yeah. Perfectionism, a little bit for the birds. But sure, but perfectibility in the sense of like striving yes. towards it, right? In the same way that a religious tradition would have you striving to, to, towards God, but you're never going to yes. reach it. You, there's a so you think I mean, actually I will. Here's a chance to quote Mill. Thank God. <laughs> um, Mill 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 said we are under a moral responsibility to improve our own character, right? So that was a very clear liberal responsibility that we should each do that. Yes. But just dis- descriptive. So that's prescriptively. Descriptively. Descriptively, do you I think, think that that it doesn't do occur people do? to most people. Some people, there's a small subset of people it occurs to explicitly. There's a broader set of people who pursue it kind of intuitively, unconsciously, selectively, partially. Um, and then I think there's a bunch of people who just try to satisfy. Us. And I think everyone is better off, both as individuals and as a, part of the reason I'm prescriptive, is I think you're better off as an individual. I'm not prescriptive just because I think it'll be a better society, uh, which I think it will be, but I'm also prescriptive because that's, that's, you'll be better off. Now, some people like, you know, uh, can become an Olympian in whatever zone they're in, you know, can be simply world-class at this. And other times it's like, look, I, that's, that's too high of a goal. But like, if all I'm seeking to be is a little bit more compassionate to my family and my friends, a little bit better of a parent, a little bit better of a colleague. Great. It doesn't have to be the, you know, superhuman for everyone. Right. Um, it just, but it's a, but it's a, it's a, a growth orientation, yes. 
which you think both should be in everybody and as a matter of fact probably is to some extent it just varies it just varies and actually i think you know to some degree look and 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 i think we should all be collectively trying to push each other nudge each other mm -hmm. towards this and so sure i think there will be some people who go no i don't care about growth i'm perfect as i am or i think that's that's a fool's game or that's you know i i hate other people you know or any number of uh, things that could be all of which I think is a form of dysfunction and ill health, um, but um, but I think that it's a we are better off the more of us adopt this as an approach. Yeah, yeah, that's the sort of it's whether you want your friend to challenge you yes. or not, right? Whether that makes them a good or a bad bad friend. One I've been just doing a lot of work on uh, boys and men, um, and I'm interested in the question of whether or not women and men have different kinds of friendship. Uh, I, you tell a story about a college friend of yours allowing you to observe an all-female conversation and you said that this isn't the conversation kind of conversation I ever have and I don't know whether that was a comment about you then or a comment about you generally or a comment about men um, and do you do you think that there are any differences in the natures of the nature of friendships that men and women I think, think um, it's almost super obvious that it is um, and I haven't done hmm. the discussion around discussion in depth with kind of the modern youthful generation of high school and college in this, but I've done it when I was in college. I've done it with my generation now, older and a little younger. I've done it across cultures. I've done it um, even with other genders. And like, if you just take a heterosexual universe, and obviously we're in a more gender, we're, we're in progress towards a more understanding of gendered fluidity and where this plays in. But if you just took a simple hetero, um, uh, you know, heterosexual universe and you went male to male, male to female, female to female, female to male, you'd realize that in the, these boxes of friendship, there are different patterns. There's a collect, there's some similarities across all of them, but what your mode of interaction would be in being friends there uh, that would be expected as to what the dynamic is to how we're making each other better is different in each of these circumstances. There's some difference of expectation. There's some difference of responsibility. There's some difference in what the duty of loyalty is. There's some difference in what your, like, because like I think friendship is based in a concept of equality um like two mm -hmm. people being as humans equal uh, and what does that play into and so i actually think it is actually different in all these cases and that's part of the reason why that was a great gift um for my friend kinderan who um um uh you know basically uh because we had been talking about gender and friendship and so forth and she's like you don't understand this at all i was like really he's like yeah, yeah i'll arrange this and you could sit there and I, <laughs> my mind was blown um <laughs> well, this is this is this is when your career as a predictive philosophical anthropologist clearly started, right? You you're being an anthropologist. Seeing that I'm interested in um, some of the psychology around this, which is partly just about the mode with which we communicate. There's this line about men being more shoulder to shoulder yes. than face to face, uh, in that they kind of interact with each other better when they're doing something, um, and that, that that women will very often kind of they're much better face face to face than the, the guy is. Stereotypically, fishing or driving or whatever, whatever it is. Um, but there is this this question of the moral equality of the friends. I think spills over into a broader view about society. And actually, you've, I mean, we're I'd be interested to see where you take this if you do write more on friendship, which I hope you do, because you've actually talked about can I can I be a friend to humanity? Can I expand the notion of friendship more into into what you might have thought was kind of civic friendship. And back to your friend Aristotle, he, he wrote that friendship seems to hold states together. And so there's this, this kind of even more sort of broader view of friendship, which isn't just this interpersonal um, way to grow, but it's actually a, a, a broader sense of what, a being, being in this together. But we're not on particularly friendly terms right now uh, across certain divides within society. So how does your conception of friendship alter the way you think about 
community and politics, and particularly in a moment where I think we are kind of quite divided. You know, can friendship save us from the culture <laughs> war? Is a, you know, is one way to put it. Well, I would, I would, would be super hopeful if so. Although I think it's very difficult. I mean, I do think um, our current U.S. President Biden, um, you know, put it very well. And that part of a democracy is that you, you, um, you, you give ground even when you lose you know, as part of this. Mm. And I do think that we're seeing a particularly heinous moment around, you know, a set of kind of would be tin pot autocrats, um, you know, denying the truth of the 2020 election due to simple media assertion. I mean, because, you know, if you if you reflect it, it's like, oh, wait, your theory is that sleepy President Joe Biden stole the election from Trump by co-opting Republican secretaries of elections all, in states, all of, them. all of them together, and all the judges, and all, and yeah, all the Republican and, judges, and, all and, of them, and from a sitting president who had a Republican Senate, <laughs> right? That's your theory of this case. Have you looked in the mirror? Uh, I mean, it's just, it's just, it, it, and, and yet, um, because it's you know, like back to Goebbels of Nazi thing, it's tell the big lie and tell it often. We have a serious problem. Now, you know, do I think that um, your average citizen who's going along with this believes that they're in kind of as it were the big lie? Probably not, because what is happening is the institutions that they trust, you know, uh, you know, people like uh, minority speaker Kevin McCarthy or other people are telling them this and they go, oh, OK, I believe the big lie. And, you know, um, and so, you know, I think that the. Uh, I think that the 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 thing here is is how do we collectively get to truth? Now, part of that is you have to think, okay, you know, I can see people that are definitively lying that I don't trust, that I don't feel friendship with, but I don't then take everybody that's in that group and think that they are all liars, <laughs> right? I do think that we have a broken right. system, and and what's the way that we can get across to say, no, no, we should in fact actually be understanding things. And by the way. Like another place that's simple is they say, well, but there was this instance of these 100 fraud ball- fraud- fraudulent ballots. And you, by the way, this has been true for every uh, election in, in U.S. history. Sure. <laughs> right but it's not but it's but it's not about it's it, it's it's not about the truth it's in in that literal sense it's about the truth of the narrative it's about the story and and actually i've had this experience with kind of close family members as well and i think the question is and, and i've thought about this idea of moral equality and how we treat each other and think about each other do you think that you could be friends good friends by your definition with someone who currently believes that the election was stolen? I think um, it would be impossible to do until we cleared it, um, which is we would have to have the conversation to bedrock where we saw the world the same way. And you'd have to engage the conversation to be open to say, okay, so I have a, I've done a lot of research and a lot of thinking about this. And I think I'm, I'm, pretty darn certain that I'm right about this, but let's have an open conversation. Let's reason about it together. Let's adjudicate facts and interests. And that's part of the reason why I went and looked at some of these claims. And I said, okay, well, yeah, sure. There was a couple of ballots here and a couple of ballots there and so forth. And there was kind of an issue, but, but that's, that's, that's no different from the 2016 election. No different from the 2012 election. No different from the 2008 election. No different from the 2004, 2000. So, so that does not, uh, a stolen election make, and so, um, and so you'd have to do that. But it's, but it's more about the yes, it's, it's the relationship dynamic that's interesting in those circumstances because that degree of humility and restraint that you've just described is sometimes hard to, hard well, to get. Well, you're going to take someone out, seriously. Get out. You have to take them seriously as a truth teller, right? And you have to take them seriously for kind of what's going on. And, and look, one of the bits that I throw in my mind is, is this other person a truth teller or not? And once I conclude they're not a truth teller, I cannot be friends with them, right? Yes, well, this comes back to this virtue of truthfulness thing. And, and you can be wrong and still be a truth teller. In fact, yes. we often are. We get stuff wrong, but, I, but I'm, a, I, I'm truthfully wrong in the sense that I thought it was 
I thought it was uh, true at the time I was saying it. And then we go to find out that it's not true and I don't repeat it. I think this, uh, this is what back to Bernard Williams actually says like, the real test is not, do you get stuff wrong? It's what do you do when presented with strong, with good evidence that it's wrong? Do you say it again or do you amend? So it's the amendment yep. process. Amend. That's the and then also, do you that. seek that evidence? Do you recognize it as evidence? Um, you know, do you, do you like, there's almost like there's levels, like you could say there's, there's different levels of skill and practice in being a truth finder, a truth discoverer, because it's the, that's why you look for, like you look for disconfir disconfirmatory. Who's the most serious person I can talk to who yes. would give me some, something to think about here? Yes, yes, I need to, to test to test your own views on it. So do we have time to talk about mystical atheism? Awesome, because I'd love to talk a little bit about that because that's how you describe yourself uh, as a mystical atheist, which is kind of very contrary to the kind of rationalist community that we see in kind of Silicon Valley, which you know you, you know all about and we kind of know all about, which would be very, very different um, to that. And so I'm very, I'm interested, and, and I think it's probably fair to say you're more interested in religion and, and ritual than, than many others. I think I read somewhere that you discussed artificial intelligence with a group of catholic true. priests which is that true i'd love to hear more about that conversation but but mostly i want to hear like it seems to me there's a it's a direct read across from the conversation we're just having which is that there's a little bit of epistemic humility there there's a little bit of like stuff we don't of, of not knowingness uh in the mystical bit am i uh, reading 100 well, right? uh a couple of things so one is a classic failure of humanity broad, broad failure humanity is not really leaving room for the unknown. There's lots of unknowns. And by the way, even when we have these pretty definitive, you know, like lots of work on scientific stuff, you know, our scientific theories at some tempo get completely recast, right? So even though, for example, you know, we still have Newtonian mechanics, you know, our, our understanding of Newtonian mechanics has changed a lot <laughs> with, mm -hmm. you know, relativity and quantum mechanics and, and, and okay. everything else is part of it. And, and that's part of what evolves. And so, um, and so having a very strong appreciation for the unknown without going, well, we don't have knowledge. We don't have truth. Who knows? Like, maybe it's good that we should all be cannibals and eat babies, because who knows? You're like, no, 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 I'm pretty sure we shouldn't all be, be, be cannibals, and we definitely should not eat babies, right? So, like, you can't take this dumb relativism and, like, who knows, to these idiotic, you know, this is a reductio ad absurdum for those things, to these, to these lengths. Mm -hmm. But you do say, look, I have claims to knowledge, I have beliefs to knowledge, I have reason to believe quantum mechanics and relativity are true, I will act as if they're true, um, you know, I... There's a bunch of very smart people working on it. I don't work on that myself. I trust that institution of the reasoning and everything else that comes from that as, as part of how it happens. This is part of the, also how we pragmatically have the social construction of truth in terms of, of how we operate. But there's always unknowns. And so, for example, too often what happens amongst the atheist or secular humanist community is they go, well, this physical world is all there is and it means X. And you go, well boy, there's a lot of unknowns. Like, yes, we have this Big Bang Theory, but the Big Bang Theory doesn't really postulate cosmological reasons for a Big Bang. And so whether that's a good theory, might be true and might, you know, be evolved and so forth. But like, you know, what caused the Big Bang and how does that operate? You know, interesting questions. Mm -hmm. And so there's a bunch of things. Plus, you know, we have this weirdness of being conscious beings. Um, and we don't really have any good theory of consciousness. Um, we, we have a good theory that we're physically embodied and we know that, you know, under drugs or injury or other things, our conscious state changes. So we know it's like against previous theories that it's this accidental mm -hmm. tie between a soul and a physical being. It's like we know that it it's really deep in the physical substrate at the absolute minimum um, uh, because, you know, a bunch of things that we treat as us change in these physical things like you can you can you know feed someone a lot of lsd and and, and mm -hmm. well boy they they behave differently um and they experience the world differently and so um and so you you have a whole bunch of, of knowledge about the physical substrate but we still don't understand consciousness and what does that mean and so therefore you know kind of what i and i do this kind of deliberately to say look i'm i'm I, i'm an atheist but i'm a mystical atheist 
I, I'm I'm a believer in the unknown, and I'm a believer in in discovery in these kind of things. And I have a have a have a kind of a everything from a pioneer to a to a curious learner to a scientist mindset on these things. And I think there's something important and special about life as conscious beings as we're discovering it and making it. And uh, I think that's important to hold dearly. And you've used uh, the word soul there, right? <clears throat> and you've used it unironically. And so whilst you can't rationally prove in the existence of the soul, there's something to it. I can't remember who somebody said that some true, some things are just too beautiful to, to not, to not be untrue, right? They're just, it's too, it's too beautiful. It has to be, there's a sort of, there's a, truthfulness that comes from the beauty of an idea and the work that that idea can do for you both as an individual which goes beyond the the, the limits of these rationalist kind of epistemological views so when when are you going to bring all this to, i mean you've written lots of books you've said you're going to write a book about friendship i'm fascinated by these boundary issues too between what we know what we don't know ideas of spirituality etc and how that this sense of relate this this relation, relational theme, which has kind of run through this conversation, which because I think that runs through your work and comes out in all different ways. Where does this go now for you? What's what's next for you, mostly intellectually? Because there's very many Reed Hoffman, so I'm I'm particularly interested in the sort of the philosophical, intellectual. What did you call it? Your predictive <laughs> philosophical yes. anthropologist, Reed Hoffman. Where, where's he, where's he going? Well, next? I mean, I am doing more and more uh, work of this sort. I think this year I'm going to be doing somewhat more because I always, you know, view myself to be somewhat embedded in society and how I'm navigating that to try to get us to understand how to be, call it techno humanists, um, how to think that with technology we can continue to make great progress and that it's an important part of building towards the future. Because part of the, the factionalism we see right now is when people don't believe the future is going to be better. It all becomes the, what do I get from you now? And it's all that competing. And I think part of then it becomes zero. It becomes zero exactly. sum immediately. Yeah, right. I mean, one of my favorite books uh, by Robert Wright is non-zero, um, and I think it's the mm -hmm. you know we we should have a preference for constructing and living in non-zero sum universes. And as we grow, maybe person one or person two gets a little bit more of the growth than person three or four. Um, and we try to make sure it's not systematically biased or anything else, but but that's fine because we can play again and play again and play again and 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 kind of grow our way into mutual opportunity. And I think that uh, I think is 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 very important. And I think technology is a central part of of how to make that work. Like if you think about why could be ten to fifty years from now much better than now, I think uh, almost for sure whatever it is from climate to economic justice, to social justice, to, um, you know, lifespan and medical, all of the answers involve technology at their core. This, uh, this idea that we've kind of, we've invented the future, and, and I know you're a big sci-fi fan, um, partly for that reason, I think is incredibly important because, especially in a market economy, the idea of the future being more bountiful and expansive than the present is actually central to the operation of the economy itself in terms of capital accumulation and so on too. And one of the things that, that, that I've said before is that the real enemy of capitalism is not socialism, it's pessimism. Because if you lose that sense of a kind of more predictable future, I think what's interesting about what you're saying is that, is that tech is just a massive part of that conversation now. Like, is the future going to be better? Yes or no? I, I think... You know, having gone through techno utopianism, tech lash, kind of etc., the the answer to the question of whether tech is going to make the world better or not is now inseparable from the question of whether the world is going to be better or not in yep, people's hundred percent. And one of the things, by the way, just from Excuse words you just used, I describe myself as a techno optimist, not a techno utopian. Just because you can build the technology right. doesn't mean the tech the, the world is better that way. But you can, through how you build the technology and what you do with the technology, make the world better. Well, it's been a, a, a fascinating conversation, Reed, as I, I hoped it would be. I'm incredibly grateful to you for, for the time that you spent with me on Dialogue. So thanks for Always coming on. Always a pleasure, Richard. I look forward to the next conversation.
Thanks for listening to Dialogues. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And if you did, please take a moment to follow, like, rate, and share the podcast in all the usual places. And send me your thoughts and ideas, including for future guests, to dialoguespod at gmail.com. That's dialoguespod at gmail.com. I'll see you next time.